about me. The point is, this is why you have fire. It's because you have a people group that you need to step to. You have a region, you have a destiny. And as long as we live in this Christianity that doesn't wanna be vocal, they don't wanna step out in the supernatural, nothing else is gonna work for this nation. New England was found, the awakenings were founded on revival preaching, unfortunately, you need to open your eyes. On men and women that had the audacity to say things that nobody else wanted to hear. People that had fire. Look, I got the, I got the articles. These people were so offended at them. They came into our church and they're like, what in the world is this guy even doing? I mean, who is he? Who travel preaches? And these men had such limited understanding. It's so crazy. And they would stand in the pulpits of our church and they would say, you need a new birth experience. And Whitfield would be weird and dramatical and wear gowns and act out plays. And they were like, who are you? And, and all of a sudden, this Calvinistic, I don't want to do anything for God mentality starts getting shattered. And these men come into New England and they're like, dude, you need to wake up. You have a part to play in this. And these men and women would say, what do I even have to do? And they're like, I don't even know, but come and toil at the altar until you feel a release. Can you believe that was Whitfield's message? The limited understanding they had? They didn't even know what they were saying. Because they were preaching to a church that had fallen asleep. They were preaching to a people that have lost their way. We're back at that again. We have hit a reset 280 years later. Look, I'm not no world, I'm New England. Do you understand me? Me and my team are going home tonight in New England to go to bed. I was born here. I'm not some other guest speaker, I'm you. And we live in a day where everybody's scared to talk. We'd rather have worship gatherings. Nobody wants radical preaching anymore. Don't offend me. Don't so step on me. No, I'm going to step all over you. I'm going to footprint your forehead. Because the church better get her voice back. The church better be bold again. Boldness better be restored to the body of Christ. And that's what the fire does. It doesn't ask for permission. It stands boldly where God's calling you to go. It doesn't look back on another day in your life that seemed greater. This is the greatest hour we've ever known. Right now. This is the greatest revival I've ever experienced right now. I'm not going to chase something that has already been given to me. The day of Pentecost was not about tongues. It wasn't about your jacked up doctrine. It was about the Holy Spirit visiting the church and living in me. Oh, I've been equipped to do everything he said I can do. I've been already filled. He's already given me the spirit in you, the spirit that raised Christ from the dead. We better start raising the dead. We better start raising the dead. You will know when you see radical preaching restored. You will know. Listen to me. I get that I'm tolerated. It's going to change. You are about to see men and women burn like you've never seen. You're about to see, and I ain't talking about the loud ones. You're going to see old ladies at 80 years old preach with fire and power. You're about to see 15-year-olds rise up and declare with boldness the word of the Lord. The fire of God is going to be restored in New England. The fires of awakening are going to burn again. And they will not go out. There's no other option. There's no other option. We've got to live with no option. I've watched in my short little life on this earth, people cheer in meetings and go back to barrenness. 
I've watched waves come and go, and, and it's like, did you get anything at that day? Oh yeah, you're there. I thought the eagle was at work. I didn't know it was, I'm all scared up here. This thing's about to grab my neck. God wants us to do two things. The fire's gonna do two things. It's gonna set you apart and it's gonna cause you to have radical boldness. Radical boldness. I realized shortly after I got saved that you can't give somebody something that you've never touched. And all these hurting people in dead churches trying to get something that they don't even know what it is. And I got saved in this church and the banner in the lobby said all the right things. We're spirit filled, we're this, we're that, we're blah, blah. No, the banner's down, nobody believed them. And I realized that what I'm after, I can't get from somebody that's never touched him. We must receive fire. We must receive boldness. That is the church that'll be unstoppable. All the confusion today about Jesus is ridiculous. It's so interesting that he said to Peter, who do people say that I am and blah, blah, blah. He said, but we know who you are. And he said, upon this rock, no Catholic people, that's not what he meant. He said, you upon the rock of understanding of who I am, I'll shake this world and hell will never touch that. But who is Jesus? In Mark 6, they looked at him and they thought, aren't you the brother of James and aren't you the son of whoever? Were they right? Yeah. But they didn't fully understand who he was. And it's no different today. Jesus is not a box you check on a text form. He's not a man that you just meet at a conference. He's not a guy that you just blow a shofar with. Whatever you see in him is what you're gonna see. And when I look at him, there's no filter. I want everything he said. I'll die for that message. There's not a, there's not a person on the planet that'll make me feel inferior to what the words was he already told me. And he left us power. And he left us boldness. And he left us the power to live a holy life. And we can't tolerate anything else. Any other gospel is not that gospel. I don't care if it's not popular. I don't care if it's you and two other people in a coffee shop. It's timeless. I'm at this massive Christian concert because, I don't know, God likes hooking me up with worship people. And recently, I, I can't even say it, and, and I'm talking to this dude, and he calls me the next day, you know, does stadiums and all this stuff, and you know, all these dudes, man, they're all like struggling. What is going on with the church? Blah, blah, blah. What's going to happen? Why is this? Why? I said, look, that ain't my experience. I said, I'm sorry you've been hurt by people that misrepresented Jesus, but you want to know what it's going to look like in the days ahead? Just what it's always looked like, ladies and gentlemen. Demons coming out of people, miracles taking place, Jesus visiting a generation. As crazy as this nation is right now, it was no different in the 60s. People were nuts, spitting on soldiers. I'm going to talk like I lived it. Please don't tell me you lived in the 60s. That's ancient. <laughs> Think about it, man. Think about what I'm telling you. They were spitting on soldiers. They hated the government. It, it was just relentless. Mobs of people were against this nation. And then God starts visiting hippies. And he starts moving in people groups in Southern California. And then 10,000 are being baptized in Corona Del Mar. And then the Jesus movement rises out of that crap. 
you don't think we're back there again? That God will visit again a people that just don't even care. They've already been touched by him. That he'll just visit people in the night. He'll just touch heroin addicts in New London and cause them to shake cities. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And if you get anything, this week you better get some fresh fire. Because let me tell you how this works. We host events all the time with just as many, if not more people. Let me tell you how this works. I'm not worried about this weekend. I want to talk to you the following Monday when everybody's gone and you're back to whatever casket you're living in. That's what's going to make a difference for me. What people group have you given your life for? What are you standing for and believing for today? That, my friends, will determine what happened this weekend. Because if it doesn't cause us to go and shake our cities and make a difference in our people group, then what is it for? You've been through good meetings. What? I'm after awakening. I'm after the church being revived. I'm after men and women seeing Jesus for who he really is. Loving the poor, feeding those that are not fortunate, laying hands on the sick. Hearing from God and shaking this land. That's what's available to us. You're awakeners. You are revival. Legit. You are. I know you're going to have some amazing worldwide speakers. You know what I'm excited about? You. Because there ain't nobody else going to ride in this land on a white horse. It's this bunch. Look around the room. Cellulite and all. It's every single one of us. You're the, you are it. You are the overcoming company that was prophesied about. You are awakening. You are revival. You, you, you are the answer to the cry of Whitfield. You are the answer to the cry of D.L. Moody. When they lived and they, it was you they had in mind. You were the generation God saw in 2017 that would take a baton. It's you. And you're going to leave with boldness. And you're going to leave with a fresh fire. And you're going to leave with things that have changed. As I was driving here, I knew when I woke up this morning. We're going to pray in a moment here. I knew when I woke up this morning that God wanted to release a fresh fire on you. I knew it. And as I'm driving here, kind of skittish, a little sketchy area. Not sure what's going on here. We're driving down the road. I couldn't even believe it. There was a, there was a legit street sign. Not like some ghetto janked up deal, like a legit one like the, the city put in or whatever town village you live in. And it said Pentecost. Yeah. What? Pentecost Road? Friends, I know famous people I don't even want to photo op. I had to get out the car and take a pic with Pentecost Road. And it's this little dead end road. Legit. I mean, it's called Pentecost Road. I wish you could look at my iPhone 8 and see the picture. Pentecost Road. And I'm like, oh my Lord. But here's what was crazy about it. When you drive down that little road, <laughs> there's a cemetery at the end of it. Yeah, you better run now. Yeah, here we go. I'm pulling the slingshot back. <laughs> you know, it reminded me, 120 people got filled in the upper room. Acts 18 and 19 said that all the province of Asia heard the word Lord in two years. 120. We live in a day, they did a poll back in the 90s, said a half a billion people claim to speak in tongues. A half a billion. And I ain't never seen so much darkness. Because a Pentecost experience should not lead you to a spiritual grave. Tongues should have never been a false finish line.
I'm so thankful for YWAM in your life in 1981. I'm so grateful for your Jesus experience in 1973. But all the enemy did to so many is just draw a false finish line. And the minute you started speaking in tongues, it was like, wow, I made it. What? My son is not even in kindergarten. He was in pre-K, I don't even know what he was in. He was in a private nature school last year. It is the beginning of a whole life of education and schooling and ministry. Tongues is the nature school before pre-K. Tongues is like, you're not even in a grade. Speaking in tongues is like, wow, you just walked in. And somehow we parked at one experience when we should have just went for it. And here we are on Pentecost Road in a graveyard at the end of it. And I thought, man, we have got to get back, lay down your issues, lay down your misconceptions, and we got to get back to Pentecost. I don't care. I'm not talking about suit wearing cranky people. I'm talking about Acts 2 upper room. I'm talking about the flame of God empowering us to have encounters, to prophesy, to lay hands on the sick. Jesus, Jesus. We were never meant to live without it, ever. And I believe in the days ahead will be marked with supernatural boldness. It happened to Peter, come on man. You forgot Peter was the joke. Peter's getting rebuked here and there, calling Jesus aside, ripping him. Peter was nuts. Peter would, on one moment, Jesus would say great things. On the next one, he'd be rebuked. Literally, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. That's not even like, girl, you acting like a devil. You know what I mean? That's like, you are the one. There's only trademark, TM, there's only one Diablo and you're it. That's piercing words. And then Peter denies him at the cross. Gosh, one moment I want to know when I get to heaven is when they re Peter's on the boat and Jesus comes back. They didn't recognize him. And he says, after G they denied him, everyone, you realize everybody denied him. And all those disciples except John would die a martyr. And Peter, I want to know what happened. When, when here Peter is, remember, one of the most depressing, saddest moments in Scripture is in the book of Luke where Peter said, I'm going back fishing. It was like he gave up. It was like Peter, come on, I'm talking to some of y'all right now. It was like Peter said, you know what? I can't do anything right. I keep getting in trouble, and I just denied him at the cross. I'm going to go back fishing. And of course, Jesus shows up throw out your net oh I remember this scene and and the Bible says that as they were the nets were being so filled Peter recognizing it was him jumped in that water and bolted and then they were dealing with the harvest and finally got in I want to know what that interaction was man and it makes sense why on the day of Pentecost they were like what's happening and wouldn't it be Peter? Wouldn't it be right for it to be Peter? The one that nobody trusted, the one that was the big mouth in the flesh. Come on, some of y'all are right now. Wouldn't it be like Peter that the fire would fall? And when Peter said, wait, these men are not drunk as you, all of a sudden they're going, whoa, this isn't, I don't know him, Peter. This isn't, I, I deny him, Peter. This isn't crazy, Peter. This is Pentecost, Peter, with the fire and boldness of the Holy Ghost. And this is what the fire does. It separates. It pulls out one from the other, and it sets you apart for what God has called you to do.